I'd like to visit for just a few minutes about your engine overhaul. Uh, sometimes we are contacted by people who are interested in possibly having an engine overhauled, and they ask questions about to what standard will my engine be overhauled? And, um, and are you rebuilding the engine? Or are you overhauling it? Are you repairing it? What exactly are you doing? And these terms, uh, some of these terms, are strictly advertising terms that people throw out. Other terms have actual FAA definitions. And what we have chosen to describe our overhauls as is a factory new limit overhaul. Now, I'd like to explain what that means. If we go to the, um, to the overhaul manual, and I'm just choosing back in the um, uh, table of limits, uh, the crankshaft and master rod bearing diameter. If we look at that for a minute, it gives three numbers there. The first number is the manufacturer's uh, minimum dimension. The next number to its right is the manufacturing maximum number, and then the next to the right is the serviceable maximum allowable. So what this says is that when Lycoming built this engine originally, that the clearance between the crankshaft and the master rod bearing could be anywhere from one and a half thousand sluice to two and a half thousand sluice, and they would call that new. That was the manufacturing minimum and the manufacturing maximum. Then they said it could wear out to three and a half thousand sluice before it was unserviceable. So one and a half to two and a half new, three and a half as being a service limit. With an overhaul, it is acceptable to uh, put a part in that would be at three and a half thousands. That would be an acceptable overhaul by overhaul definitions. However, what we're choosing to do is we're choosing to keep our overhauls within the manufacturer's minimum to maximum limits. That way, if Lycoming in 1935 called it new, then we're going to call it new. If Lycoming said, well, it's not new, but it's within the service limits, we're not going to use that. So, so what the engine that, that you receive from us will be one that is built to the manufacturer's tolerances. So that's, that's when we say it's a, it's a manufacturer's limit overhaul, that's what we're talking about. Um, there are several things that we do that are above and beyond um, even what the factory did when, um, when these engines were new. One is cosmetic detailing. For most of these engines, there was a war going on, and the military really didn't care what they looked like. So they slapped paint on them and, uh, and went down the road. We spend a lot more time detailing our engines than uh, Lycoming ever did on any of their engines. So there's, there's more polishing that goes on. Um, the nose cases are sanded and filled and then primed and sanded and then the, the uh, final coat is put on them so that that, that gives kind of that uh, mirror finish that, that we're known for. Uh, we do balancing. Now, Lycoming did balancing of their engines, but it was, it was only <clears throat> um, an original balance. So they, they balanced the engines originally. They said, well, any part that falls between this weight and this weight, we'll use it. And so they could use parts that were sometimes 30 or 40 grams in difference. Pistons, for instance. We've seen new Lycoming pistons that had 30 or 40 grams of difference. We're balancing the engines much closer than that. We're balancing to three grams. Three grams is the weight of a paper towel, a single paper towel. So that's, that's the kind of, of balancing job that we're doing on these engines. And it really is making a difference. It makes a very, very smooth engine um, that doesn't have any vibration characteristics throughout its range. The mechanics that we have working here are the best in the business. These guys have been at it for a long time. Uh, we've got a combined 180 years of experience. <laughs> it's hard to believe that, but it's true. Um, we, um, uh, you know, most of the guys that work here have been with me for 10 years plus. Um, three of the guys have been with me for 20 years plus. 
So these are people that have made a commitment to, um, to work on radial engines. It's their passion and they're good at it. Um, back in the early days, we were faced with a decision about how we were going to face the FAA. And, and every repair, repair facility is faced with that, that choice. Uh, the two choices seem to be you either lay low and stay way under the radar and hope that they never find out who you are or where you are. Uh, the other is to meet them head on and, um, and shake their hand and get to know them. And that's really the, the tack that we have taken. We decided that we would become a repair station and so we went through the, um, the hoops that the FAA had for us to do that. We had to write a repair station quality manual, which um, is, is a fairly exhaustive thing that, that explains to the FAA and everyone else how things will be done here. And so, and they hold us to it. They come in and, and audit us and say, okay, are you, are you doing the things that you said here? For instance, are you um, calibrating your micrometers every six months the way that you said you would? Because if you aren't, then there's a problem. And are you having your Magnaflux machine calibrated? And do your inspectors have eye exams so that we're sure that they can actually see what they're looking at? Um, you know, if, if you're uh, an A&P out there working on your own or an A&P working um, at a, a non-certificated facility, um, those, those are not things that are checked. They, the FAA is not checking up on whether you can actually see or not or, or whether uh, your Magnaflux machine is within calibration. But we chose to, um, to embrace that and, and be a part of that. We even uh, have a training manual which is an FAA mandated thing. So, so we developed a training program and this is how we train our people. And they're, they're not only trained, they're cross-trained so that we have inspectors that are, that are training in the cylinder room and we have cylinder room people that are learning final assembly and, and, um, and so that, that everybody has an understanding of what happens in every portion of our repair station. So uh, it's, it's been a good thing to have the FAA on board. We, we have a good relationship with our FISDO. We do um, uh, exports with them all the time, uh, exporting to other countries. And, um, and it's, it's been good to have uh, people that we can work with within the FAA. Well, we may not have seen everything that there is to see, uh, but we've seen a whole lot of it. We, we've seen a whole lot of what the Lycoming engine can do. Um, every once in a while we see a, a new trick, like the one that I described a little earlier, where uh, I had never seen um, a liquid lock caused by fuel before. That was a new one on me. But, um, but mostly what we see is the same thing over and over and over again with these engines. And so it's given us confidence that, um, you know, that there, there are just not a lot of things new that these engines are going to do that, that, we, that we don't know about. Uh, one of the things that you will get from us uh, in an overhaul is thorough documentation of what happened with your engine. So we have a sheet that is an incoming inspection sheet that we do on a customer's engine when it arrives here. Along with that, we shoot about 30 or 40 photographs of that engine from every angle so that when we put it back together again, we know the angles that your fittings were at and we know what things came in and what things didn't come in with your engine. So we have a, um, an incoming inspection form. Then we have inspection forms that go through each assembly as we assemble the cylinders, as we assemble the accessory case, the power case, things are signed off. And, uh, and the mechanic who did the work signs that work off. So we can go back and say, okay, he's the guy that, that did this work, and this is the guy that inspected his work after he did it. So we have very thorough documentation on, uh, on your, your engine. We know who built your magnetos, and we know what um, the specifications were, what uh, the coming in speed was on each magneto that we did. Um, we have a balance sheet so we can see the, um, the balance on you know, how much each component weighed as we put your reciprocating parts together. 
Then we do a, a test run when the engine is fully assembled, and we have a test run log that shows the temperatures and the pressures and the compression test at the end. It shows everything that happened there. And then we have a final inspection sheet where the uh, inspectors go over the engine uh, looking for uh, any discrepancies that they can find, uh, anything that's not been safety or um, you know, any, any kind of quality control issue, and they sign off at each place. So you get that entire paperwork package along with the 8130-3 forms for the magnetos, the 8130-3 form for your carburetor, and then an 8130-3 form for the entire engine assembly. Um, and then you get a logbook. So those are the things that will, uh, will come with your, uh, with your overhaul. A program that we instituted several years ago that's been very successful and, and very popular with uh, several of our customers has been what we call the Active Observer Program. We invite you to come in and be a part of your engine overhaul. For most people, what that means is coming in for a day to watch the engine run at the, at the end of the overhaul. And um, they, the people that have come in seem to have really enjoyed uh, being here for that, that last day. We've had several people, though, that have come with their engine uh, when, it, uh, when it was delivered here originally for overhaul and then have stayed through the entire process. Um, I, they looked like they were having a good time. Uh, two of them have, um, have contacted me and said, we enjoyed that so much, we just went out and bought another engine. Can we do it again? And so, uh, so the, those guys will be back. And uh, so anyway, we invite you to, uh, to become a part of your overhaul with us. And so, uh, you know, as much or as little of that as, um, as you would like to do. So with all those things uh, having been said, why wouldn't you want one of our engines? I mean, what's the downside here? Uh, the only downside that I can really think of is that uh, we're normally backordered. Our engines are very popular. We, um, you know, we have uh, 15 technicians right now. We're working as fast as we can, and people seem to order engines faster than, uh, than we can build them. So there is a waiting list for our engines. Um, it can run anywhere from a couple of months up to six months, depending on, uh, on just the, the workload and how, how things are progressing. Um, but uh, so anyway, if you're if you're doing a, uh, a restoration project, give yourself enough time if you want one of our engines, so that um, so that we'll have time to um, uh, to build that before you need it. Well, that's about it for today. I hope you found the information that we've uh, presented helpful. If you have uh, questions or comments, I would uh, appreciate hearing from you. So until next time, just remember, radial engines do not leak oil. They're just marking their territory.